focus on headline. All right, let's take a look at what major issues are making the headlines today on Focus on Headline. For this, joining us in the studio today, we have our reporters in Hong Sing-yeon and Chang Ana. Guys, welcome back. Good evening. Good evening to you guys. We're going to start things off with yet another overseas trip by President Yoon suk uh, He started his schedule uh, diplomatically and also uh, just overall this year has been jam-packed with initiatives in order to boost the Korean economy. Uh, President Yoon did leave for the Netherlands earlier today on a state visit. Should be a four-day state visit there. And there he is going to be promoting bilateral semiconductor cooperation. Singh has started us off. He did uh, leave for the Netherlands today. Give us a look at his itinerary over to his uh, state visit to the Netherlands. Sure. Uh, President Yoon suk yeol is visiting the Netherlands at the invitation of Dutch King Willem Alexander. And he's the first South Korean president to visit the Netherlands since diplomatic relations were established in 1961. So the four-day state, state visit will include a stop at the headquarters of ASML, the world's sole manufacturer of extreme extreme ultraviolet lithography machines, which are essential in the production of advanced chips. Yoon will be accompanied by the heads of the top two chip makers, Samsung Electronics Executive Chairman Lee Jae-yong and the SK Chairman Cha Tae-won. Now, Yoon will be the first foreign leader to be invited inside a clean room manufacturing facility at the ASML headquarters in Veldhoven on Tuesday. And the Netherlands is the largest investor in South Korea among European Union member states and the second largest commercial partner after Germany. Now, the emphasis on uh, semiconductor highlights the industry's rising strategic relevance as maintaining solid supply chains has grown critical amid an intensifying U.S.-China competition over breakthrough technologies. So President Yoon hopes that increased, sem uh, increased semiconductor collaboration with the Netherlands will help South Korea's military industry flourish further as well. And other engagements on the president's calendar include a visit to The Hague, Asian Peace Museum, and meeting in Amsterdam with Dutch veterans of the Korean War, and a business roundtable between South Korea and the, and the Netherlands. Now, of course, uh, it's interesting because uh, it's not the first time that South Korea and the Netherlands have been pushing for further cooperation in the semiconductor uh, industry because uh, ever since the start of the Biden administration, as you guys know, uh, the U.S. has been urging a number of semiconductor powers, like, for example, uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, the Netherlands, and also Japan, to share information about their semiconductor technology and uh, it, all the countries were a little bit hesitant on this, right? I mean, it's, it's, even if it's the United States, it's like, come on, guys, we can't give you all the information on our technology. And so I remember a couple of years back, or was it last year, uh, that the uh, the South Korean side and the, Netherlands, the Dutch side uh, decided they were going to cooperate further in trying to prevent the U.S. from taking too much of their technology was what it was. And so now we're going to be seeing uh, more collaboration on this front with this trip by President Yoon suk yeol over the weekend, the first dialogue between Seoul and Washington agreed during a U.S. state visit in April on technology cooperation took place. The top security advisors of South Korea, the U.S. and Japan also uh, met here in Seoul to reaffirm commitments made during the summit at Camp David back in August. Hannah, let's get the latest on these meetings. Sure. Now, as South Korea and the U.S. tried to upgrade their technology cooperation and modernize mm. the ROK-U.S. alliance into a more comprehensive one, the first next-generation critical and emerging technologies dialogue was held in Seoul on Saturday, and it was chaired by the two countries' national security advisors, Cho Tae-yong and Jake Sullivan. Now, this is a follow-up to President Yoon suk yeol's state visit to the U.S. in April, and at this meeting, the two countries discuss comprehensive cooperation measures in the semiconductors, quantum, bio, batteries, clean energy, AI, and digital fields. They also agreed to hold an informal uh, tripartite dialogue between South Korea, the U.S., and India early next year. Specifically, some agreements include exploring a cooperative
collaborative opportunities between their semiconductor technology centers and supporting joint research projects between South Korea's Ministry of Science and ICT and the U.S. National Science Foundation. And additionally, they committed to investing at least 10 million U.S. dollars in collaborative research in the bio sector. And in the meantime, on the same day, four months after the trilateral summit at Camp David between South Korea, the U.S. and Japan, Cho hosted Sullivan in Japan's Takeo Akiba to touch base on the spirit and principles of Camp David. And since the summit, uh, North Korea has successfully launched a reconnaissance satellite into orbit, a key discussion topic between the three. Now, they also reaffirmed the importance of a resilient supply chain and economic security while addressing ongoing issues such as the war in Ukraine and issues in the Taiwan Strait. Cho and Akiba also used strong words and, uh, to address the topic of fake news. They said that this was recognized as a challenge and threat to the fundamental matters of operating fair election processes in democratic countries and preserving the foundation of a free and democratic society. In the meantime, to welcome the two advisors, President Yoon hosted them both at his residence for dinner. And speaking of which, uh, the National Security Advisors, again, of South Mm -hmm. Korea, the U.S., and Japan, uh, they also vowed to strengthen cooperation against North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. They also mentioned the partial suspension of the September 19 inter-Korean military agreement, which, by the way, North has already scrapped completely unilaterally. So again, let's get more on this. Sure. So at the meeting, Korea and U.S. agreed that South Korea's partial suspension of the September 19 inter-Korean military agreement was a prudent and restrained measure in response to North Korea's continued violation of Security Council resolutions and agreements. So the September 19 military agreement was signed on September 19, 2018, at the height of the uh, reconciliatory mood when the South Korean president, Moon Jae-in, traveled to Pyongyang for summit talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Now, Neutral Nations Supervisory Commission made the remark expressing concerns that the scrapping of the comprehensive military agreement could increase the risks of military miscalculation because the intention of the comprehensive military agreement was to advance the armistice agreement and there will be increased uh, risks if there are no buffer zones. Well, I mean, the thing is right now, I mean, the, the agreement was in place even after the no deal in Hanoi summit but ever since the no deal uh, in Hanoi North Korea has been constantly uh, breaching the military agreement Uh, the biggest one of course was at the end of last year when they sent over spy drones uh, into the South Korean territory which is I mean beyond a breach of the inter-Korean agreements not to mention the large number the record number of uh, missile provocations we saw last year and this year as well. And so it was only fair that uh, South Korea, of course, with the launch of the military reconnaissance satellite uh, by the North, that they were going to be scrapping the, the the reconnaissance portion, the surveillance portion of the military agreement, which, of course, unfortunately led to the complete scrapping from the North Korean side. Also, North Korea reacting hysterically, quite possibly, to the U.S.-South Korea joint military drills and uh, South Korea's escalation of military exercises on Monday, claiming that nothing but ruin can be gained from the act of war provocations. Sounds very much like North Korea. Mm-hmm. Hannah, you have more on this. Sure. Now, Ro Dong Shin Moon uh, listed the recent joint air drills, joint uh, command exercises, joint maritime drills, and comprehensive defense exercises between the U.S. and South Korea and said, quote unquote, we can see the war madness of the South Koreans reaching a certain point. Now, it also condemned the repeated calls of Defense Minister Shin Won Shik and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Kim Myung Su to respond immediately and decisively to North Korea's provocation as belligerent rhetoric and saying everywhere they go they are inspiring confrontation, inciting war, and barking like mad dogs. Now, the foolishness of the rascals who, with the United States on their backs, are pursuing their northern ambitions and going down the road of confrontation and war is a futile object hastening their doom, is what the newspaper wrote. And it is seen that North Korea's allegations are aimed at blaming the South for the deteriorating uh, situation on the Korean Peninsula and building a rationale for its nuclear and missile development and armed provocations. Sure, so uh, all the, the missile provocations that North Korea has fired off on is 
nothing, right? I mean, it's excusable. But mm-hmm. of course, these joint uh, military exercises that the, the U.S. and South Korea conduct, it's invasion tactics. Again, it's very one-sided here, but uh, it sounds very much like North Korea. We're very much used to this. Uh, China's top envoy to Seoul, Shanghai Ming, urging for better relations between Seoul and Beijing on Monday, saying it's not an option, but rather an essential issue that must be resolved. Sing let's get more on this. Sure. Uh, Chinese Ambassador Xing Haiming said at a forum co-hosted by the Chinese Embassy in Seoul and the Korea Press Foundation on Monday that our win-win relations with <clears throat> South Korea remained unchanged and our desire for co-development is unwavering, calling for improved relations between South Korea and China. Uh, So there have been concerns that grew lately after China delayed customs processes for urea exports to South Korea earlier this month. And despite citing low domestic supplies, China's action aroused concerns about a repetition of the urea supply crisis that occurred in uh, 2021. So Xing emphasized the need of continuing to develop bilateral relations as a strategic cooperative partnership, emphasizing the two countries' commitment to developing the ties as a strategic cooperative partnership. And during the November foreign minister's meeting in Busan between South Korea, China, and Japan, sorry, Chinese top diplomat Wang Yi stated that conditions need to be met for the envisioned three-way summit to take place. So when reporters asked about the conditions that China warned uh, South Korea were required for a trilateral, oh, sorry, I cannot hold my laughter, a trilateral summit involving China, Singh reiterated that we reaffirmed the commitment during our foreign minister's talks and that we will push for our bilateral relations within this platform. And this is what is the most important without going further into detail. Now, as proof of solid bilateral relations, Singh cited strong commercial links, tourism revival, and Chinese President Xi Jinping's meeting with Prime Minister Han Dok-su during the Hangzhou uh, Winter Olympics. Now, in the meantime, Seoul's foreign ministry also saying on Monday that the representatives of eight member states of the North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization, or NATO, uh, will visit Seoul later this week for security talks with South Korean officials. Hannah, let's get the latest details on this. Sure. Now, according to the ministry, the NATO representatives of the United States, uh, Britain, Italy, Denmark, the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, Romania, and Poland will make a three-day trip to Seoul starting Wednesday. Now, during the visit, they plan to meet with top government officials in Seoul, including Defense Minister Shin won Sheik and First Vice Foreign Minister Chang Wo-jin. They will also attend a forum on women and security to be hosted by the U.S. Embassy in Seoul. Now, their upcoming visit to South Korea, which is not a NATO member state, is considered rare. It is seen as part of NATO's effort to uh, bolster regional security cooperation with South Korea in the in the Pacific after President Yoon's consecutive participation in two NATO summits its last year and this year. Now, let's move on here. Uh, Back here in the country, the finance ministry announcing on Monday that South Korea will be establishing a government-wide commission. Uh, This in order to oversee the comprehensive management of supply chains for commodities essential to key sectors and people's livelihoods. We've been, of course, talking about the halting of the export of urea uh, by the Chinese government. So again, let's get the latest on this. So according to the Ministry of Economy and Finance, the government also intends to establish a fund to secure important items and promote investment in related facilities as the country tries to lessen reliance on China and other nations in order to better ensure uh, stable supply chains of key items. So the measures were enacted after the National Assembly passed the Supply Chain Stabilization Act on Friday, which calls for the formation of a commission to deliberate and revise related plans, as well as the operation of an early warning system. Now, Finance Minister Chu Gyeong-ho said uh, during a supply chain management conference with other ministers that uh, they've seen growing risk factors in supply chains of items directly linked to the major industries and people's lives, such as urea, ammonium, phosphate, and graphite. 
and it was the first ministerial level meeting on the subject held by the Yoon administration. Now, the proposed commission would be led by the finance minister and will bring together key ministries and agencies, as well as economic and security specialists. So, the entity will finalize fundamental strategies for improving supply chain stability next year, which will be reviewed every three years. And uh, the government is anticipated to designate roughly 200 major raw materials and commodities as economic security items and provide subsidies and other policy instruments to promote their stable introduction, production, and stock management. And South Korea has been working hard to manage vital item supplies and diversify import channels in the wake of a series of disruptions in major item supplies. And in the most recent case, uh, China suspended customs uh, procedures for shipments of urea uh, to South Korea, as mentioned, uh, citing limited supplies for domestic use, raising concern about a repetition of urea supply crisis that occurred in uh, 2021. There's a number of things I think we need to look at. I think there's there's much more than just the uh, the domestic supply of uh, urea over in uh, China because... Even if you look at the 2021 urea shortage uh, crisis, the large number of imports that uh, China was sending out was still going to India, uh, which means that there's still sufficient amount. And not to mention data shows that right now, as of, I believe, October, China's production of urea has jumped like 9% on year, which means production is up right now. Uh, It's just a matter of the import quota that they have and who are they going to set that quota to? Is it going to be anywhere near uh, the 10% of the, the, the exports that go to South Korea? Or are they going to start, of course, again, pushing for more exports towards India is the other thing. And so is this a diplomatic thing or is it just a uh, just a whole matter of shortage in urea is the big question. I think, I think there needs to be some sort of discussion uh, between the two governments in regards to this because so far, uh, there is no solution other than to, of course, get the urea from uh, other countries. Uh, the Speaking of which, the government will extend the urea quota tariff as well, which is set to terminate at the end of this year until next year to ease the burden on the enterprises of alternative imports of urea from third countries outside of China. We've been talking about Vietnam as one of those countries. Hannah, let's get more on this. Sure. Now, while continuing to expand the volume secured through additional contracts in third countries, South Korea will also consider promoting domestic production of urea for relief in the mid to long term. The government held a ministerial meeting on economic security and supply chain relations, chaired by Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Strategy and Finance Chu kyung ho at the government complex in Seoul on Monday to discuss trends in urea supply and demand and response plans as well. The government plans to continue to increase the amount of urea imported from overseas to stabilize the domestic market. South Korea's government plans to extend the urea quota tariff, which is set to terminate at the end of this year into next year, and temporarily finance part of the shipping costs for goods brought into the country until April next year. The measures are aimed at easing the burden on enterprises who need to alternatively import from third countries outside China. And the government is also preparing an expedited inspection system that will shorten the time from application to the issuance of a test pass certificate from 20 days to 5 days in preparation for increased imports of finished urea products. And to diversify imports, South Korea decided to apply quota tariffs to automotive elements in countries such as Indonesia and South Saudi Arabia. And from January next year, South Korea will start considering building domestic production facilities for the mid to long term plan. And it also plans to monitor the domestic supply and demand situation every day and consider notifying canteens and emergency supply adjustment measures if necessary. But uh, fortunately, though, well, the government did say that the urea prices and inventories are similar to normal state with Mm -hmm. relatively stable conditions compared to the urea crisis back in 2021. Mm -hmm. But uh, what's the situation with some of the other resources? Well, well, let's start off with urea's first. Uh, As for the uh, last seven days, the price of urea at gas stations is 1,602 won, uh, Korean won, which is similar to the previous day, which was 1,599 won. So normally the price of urea is in the range of 1,300 to 1,800 won. 
won. And as of July 7th, 96.5% of gas stations nationwide had urea in stock, so you don't really have to worry too much. And the government has also decided to extend the quota duty on ammonium phosphate uh, until the ha- first half of next year. And this ammonium phosphate is a rare uh, raw material used in fertilizers in small quantities, mainly in compound fertilizers. Now, currently we have about 10,000 tons of finished ammonium phosphate and 30,000 tons of raw materials, which can be supplied until May next year. And while there have been uh, recent reports that China has been controlling ammonium phosphate exports, there are currently no imports that have been delayed at Chinese customs, which is what the government said. And graphite, which the Chinese government began exporting restrictions on December 1st, is now at a three to five month supply, depending on the company holding them. And graphite is actually an essential material for the domestic secondary battery industry, which is more than 90 percent dependent on it. And since China announced its graphite export control policy in October, the government has been working closely with the industry, holding public-private meetings. And in addition, China has been controlling exports of gallium and germanium uh, since August, but the government has diagnosed that the impact is limited as it can be supplied through alternative import sources. Gallium and germanium is used in semiconductors and displays for your information. Yeah, and I think before uh, the gallium and germanium export Mm -hmm. restrictions were put in place before too. I mean, these are uh, uh, raw materials like uh, like Hannah Mm -hmm. said, used for semiconductors. But I guess for ammonium phosphate, uh, it's for now it should be okay, right? I mean, uh, when you're talking about uh, these uh, compounds being mainly used for fertilizers, and right now we're in the winter season, and uh, there's not a whole lot of farming going on, and so as long as the the uh, the supply of ammonium phosphate uh, returns back to normal state by maybe spring next year, I think everything should be okay. But again, uh, really puts in puts you in a perspective, right? I mean, Korea has already gone through this before, and there's plans in place. There's lessons learned from the 2021 crisis, and uh, this is where the whole uh, de-risking idea comes from. Uh, and uh, let's move on here. Go over to the Middle East this time. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, calling on Hamas to surrender now calling it the beginning of the end of the militant group's existence, uh, while the Hamas have warned that there will be no return of hostages uh, without any negotiations. Certainly things do not seem to be easing whatsoever in the Middle East. Uh, Singa, let's get the latest over there. Sure. Uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Sunday called on Hamas to lay down their weapons and surrender, saying the Palestinian militant group's end is near. Uh, In a statement, Netanyahu said dozens of Hamas militants have surrendered over the past few days. However, Hamas has rejected the claims. Meanwhile, the Palestinian military group says Israel will not be able to recover any of its hostages unless it engages in talks over conditional swap deals. Now, a spokesman for the Al-Qassam Brigade said in a statement on Sunday that Israel will not be able to recover the captives by force, adding that there had been been a failed attempt by the Israeli uh, military to free one of them. He also noted uh, that Hamas fighters had partially or fully destroyed 180 uh, Israeli personal carriers, tanks, and bulldozers in a 10 days uh, since fighting began after a brief seven-day ceasefire. Now, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister and Russian President Vladimir Putin spoke over the phone for nearly an hour on Sunday, with the Israeli leader reportedly expressing dissatisfaction uh, with Moscow's stance in the armed conflict. And Russia has regularly uh, criticized Israel, including at the UN Security Council, while also hosting a Hamas delegation in late October for meetings. So according to Russia's TASS news agency, Putin uh, told Netanyahu that Moscow rejects terrorism but cannot support the dire situation of people in Gaza. Uh, Meanwhile, speaking to uh, CNN, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says it's up to Israel and not the U.S. to to decide when to end its war against Hamas in Gaza. The comments come as reports of Washington pressing on Israel to wrap up operations by the end of the year. So in a uh, show of support, Blinken defended the emergency sales of nearly 14,000 rounds of tank ammunition to Israel and called for quick 
approval、uh, from Congress for more than 100 billion U.S. dollars in aid for Israel, Ukraine, and other national security priorities. Kind of. Ironic、uh, in many ways that、uh, it's Russian President Vladimir Putin、uh, who is quite concerned about the dire situation of Gazans、uh, in the Gaza Strip right now. Because、uh, if you remember, it is still going on right now the war in Ukraine, although it's not been、uh, covered as much. But at the Uh, the first year of the war in Ukraine,、uh, what Russia was doing to the Ukrainian people,、uh, targeting a lot of these、uh, energy sources, energy grids, electricity grids,、uh, power plants,、uh, and、uh, pretty much just shutting down heat, water, energy,、uh, so that、uh, with the winter looming and、uh, the the dire situations that some of the Ukrainians in the east、uh, were going through, and yet he is going to show concerns over the people in. The Middle East right now with the Gazans, it's quite ironic, and also it's also ironic that I believe over the weekend、uh, during the UN Security Council meeting that it was the U.S. who vetoed. They used their veto, but we all when we talk about vetoing at the UN Security Council,、uh, sorry, at the UN、uh, is. It's always China and Russia, right? Using、mm-hmm. their veto powers against、uh, all the resolutions uh, for uh, what is it,、uh, North Korea? And well, this time it was、uh, the U.S. who said no, no to ceasefire、uh, in the Middle East. And it seems like, despite the fact that、uh, Washington, again, like Singan said, is press- pressing on、uh, Israel to kind of end this conflict as soon as possible, that they are going to show. A lot of support、uh, for the Israelis、uh, during this whole ordeal here, but、uh, in the meantime, the WHO's、uh, executive board adopted a resolution、uh, this that aimed at addressing the catastrophic humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip.、Uh, tell us a little bit more about this again. Sure. So, in a special session held on Sunday in Geneva, WHO's executive board adopted a resolution aimed at addressing the catastrophic humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. The resolution was adopted by consensus. So、uh, this is the first time since October seventh that a resolution on this conflict has been adopted by、uh, consensus within the UN system. Uh, it underscores the importance of health as a universal priority in all cir- circumstances, and the role of healthcare and humanitarianism in building br-、uh, bridges to peace,、uh, even in the most difficult of situations. And among other points, the resolution calls for immediate,、uh, sustained, and unimpeded passage of humanitarian relief, including the access of medical personnel. And it also calls on all parties to fulfill their obligations under international law. And it also reaffirms that all parties to armed conflict must comply fully with the obligations applicable to them under international humanitarian law related、uh, to the protection of civilians in armed conflicts and medical personnel. It is going to get concerning. I mean, the 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 big question is what, not when is this armed conflict going to be done and over with. I think,、uh, unlike the war in Ukraine,、uh, it, it's. Some of the experts are saying it should be end、uh, ending about sometime next month is what they said. It shouldn't take more than a month.、Uh, the Israeli military far far outpowers、uh, the Hamas militant group, and so it's just a matter of time. I mean, one one month, I think, is what there's people are saying. But it's what happens after. The so-called Hamas are done and over with, right? Because they're never really done and over with is the problem if you see it historically. And so, if the Palestinians they're allowed to go back to the Gaza Strip,、uh, who's going to overlook it? And of course, the the rebuilding aspect is a big thing because remember, this is very different in that a lot of the facilities, the buildings, infrastructures are completely damaged over in Gaza. And so, who's going to be paying for the、uh, the the rebuilding of the area? And so forth is the big thing, and you're not going to for sure get any help from the Western states. And so, we'll see what happens. In the meantime, let's move on here at COP28. Negotiators struggling to narrow their differences over the fossil fuel phase out.、Mm-hmm. International organizations stressing the world is still off track to limit global warming,、uh, despite pledges from climate talks over in Dubai. 
Hannah,、uh, tell us all about this. Sure. Now, at this year's annual UN Climate Summit, the COP28, the crux of negotiation is the phased withdrawal of fossil fuel use. Now, the conference is set to end on December、uh, 12th, but countries are clashing over the draft of adaptation goals. Some 80 countries have been able to reach a consensus on the phasing out of all carbon emitting fossil fuels, and the UAE, playing host this year, is rolling up its sleeves with high ranking officials from attending countries to draw up an agreement. This, however, is facing strong opposition, led by some of the world's biggest carbon emitters, which are Russia, Saudi Arabia, and China. Now, these countries claim that the conference should only focus on reducing climate pollution, not the fossil fuels causing it. OPEC also openly opposed the formalization of a phased withdrawal and reduction of fossil fuels and emphasized the need for a realistic approach to solving the climate crisis. And they said that there is、uh, no Single solution or path to achieve a sustainable energy future, and that we need realistic approaches to tackle the emission problem. Now, this has prompted a wide criticism from OPEC, of OPEC and oil companies, among those advocating for the cutting of carbon emissions by reducing carbon fuels. Now, OPEC and the oil companies right now are trying to whitewash the crisis that has been created by fossil fuels, is what some say. The International Energy Agency, in its report released on Sunday, Said that new pledges to be made at the climate summit are indeed positive but will not be enough. The IEA said the world still needs to catch up to meet climate targets to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, despite pledges made by dozens of countries. Climate activists symbolically releasing fluorescent substances into the Grand Canal of Venice, Italy, called for action on climate change. Meanwhile, Az-、uh, meanwhile Azerbaijan will host next year's event, COP29, on the back of support from Eastern European nations from no- November 11th to the 22nd. I don't even know what this means. Focus on reducing climate pollution, but not fossil fuels causing it, when the fossil fuels are basically. What is causing it? What's causing it, right? But it's not surprising that Russia and Saudi Arabia are saying、mm-hmm. it, right? I mean, these are、uh, the major crude oil suppliers, and so they're going to be very much against the idea of cutting fossil fuel. But China is an interesting one because China, before the COVID 19 pandemic, what they were doing is they were going for. A lot of these like climate change issues, they're trying、mm. to go pro environment, they're going to go green and stuff. And all of a sudden, their economy started tanking. They're like, you know what, we can't do this anymore, forget this. And now they're going to start, you know, going back to their old ways and they're not going to keep up. Because there was actually one point in time not too long ago when China wanted to kind of improve、uh, the environment. But、mm. uh, yeah, not surprising that Russia, Saudi Arabia, and China came out. In opposition for this. Guys, thank you very much for the reports today. Have a fantastic rest of your night, and we'll see you guys again. Thank, thank you. you. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.